Right. Uh, so, um, ever since I've become the digital minister, actually before that, uh, I have a habit of uh, making a recording, either audio or video, of everything that I do. Uh, and um, uh, we'll each have 10 days uh, after this to fix the transcript and okay. uh, to, to like take out any frames that you don't feel comfortable with. And then we'll make them public. Oh, cool. Okay. okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so uh, just a very brief introduction. Um, so I, I became the digital minister um, like October the 1st. Mm -hmm. And before that, I was a um, free software hacker. I'm still a free software hacker um, since like 95 or something. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I didn't do crypto uh, stuff after the Freenet project, which is like many years ago. Yeah. Right. Uh, and so um, mo mostly after that, I switched to uh, computer languages like uh, doing prosaics or Haskell or mm -hmm. things like that. And then I still like, keep a AI on, on blockchain development. So, okay. so at, at the moment, inside the government, I'm doing mostly open government stuff, which means um, very broadly speaking, making available the process uh, in which the administration comes to its decisions, which could be very opaque. Um, and then so I, I do it by just making transcripts available of all the meetings that I go to, mm -hmm. and then uh, trying to, to using design methods to, to make some sense out of the whole uh, process, and then making it available to, to citizens, and then also uh, to other administrations so that they can learn from each other's mm -hmm. innovations. That's the, the outgoing part. Mm -hmm. And the incoming part involves civic participation, which is um, my research interest is uh, what I call scalable listening. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, if you have a million people on the street, it's very easy to get them on the street, but it's very mm -hmm. hard to get exactly what they demand yeah. out of each other. So, uh, and people have generally using very low bit rate uh, ways of doing that, like voting, mm -hmm. uh, which you don't get many uh, useful signals out of it, and have it discarded anyway. So, uh, what I mean that is that um, every few bits, every four years, it doesn't really work. Yeah. Uh, and then, so what I've been doing is uh, using a lot of crowdsourcing mechanisms, using a lot of machine learning, using a lot of uh, principal component analysis and so on to, to get people to see each other's positions on a two-dimensional visualization map and, okay. then, and then vote on each other's ideas so that they can come closer to each other and then we get government to say, uh, if any idea reaches uh, more than supermajority consensus, then okay. we take them as binding. But, but the whole moderation effort is right. done by the crowd. So it doesn't increase uh, administrative button. Mm. Uh, so this is my main work. And um, um, the interface would look something like this. Like for example, we, we use this method to talk about Uber, uh, mm -hmm. talk about Airbnb. Right. So, so this is our Uber conversation. Oh, cool. And then... So what do the like, axes represent here? For right. Um, and this is run for, for random killing. Um, so for example, um, this one here uh, says, um, so somebody, who I don't know, Coach uh, Xu said, uh, I'm willing to live uh, in a community in which they um, execute people. Okay, so whether you agree or not. Uh, if you agree, then your avatar moves just this slightly toward the left. And then, and then you answer some other questions. Okay. I see. Right. And then as, as you do this, um, it's basically like if there's a hundred um, different statements, then it's a hundred dimension. Same, right? And then right. you can run normal regression to, to see which clusters. Right, do PCA, are. figure out what the other interventions are. And right, exactly. And then and then we map the principal one to the X and the secondary one, uh, the most orthogonal one to it, as that makes sense, to the Y. And then you can see the majority group right. here uh, says that we, we, we cannot really do away with uh, this penalty at the moment. But why? Um, well, because um, that they don't trust the, the core system that they think they may uh, let some other people act. But this, these kind of people also doesn't trust the core system. Mm -hmm. But for a completely different angle, they, they say, so so we cannot um, make like uh, unredeemable choices. Mm -hmm. right? And then despite their differences, they still agree on things like there's wide consensus saying, regardless of whether there's death penalty, it has nothing to do with random killings. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, um, and then we should discuss it as one of the normal cycle of news instead of with something uh, horrible happens so that we can uh, get to some reasonable consensus instead of being motivated by our um, emotions, right. uh, which has a 91%. And, mm -hmm. then, and, then, uh, and then helping the victims and so on is, should actually take precedence than the, um, 
like retaliation. So these types of things everybody can agree on. And then we came for Uber. Uh, we have Uber that will worry about public safety. But these people don't worry about public safety. Right. And then these people says Uber is very convenient, it's far more convenient than taxis. And these people don't agree. Uh, and then, but after three weeks, uh, we actually come to a set of coherent uh, things that says uh, we should review personnel and then the passenger and then the right of driver should be balanced, but public safety uh, goes first, so the Ministry of Transport should still have jurisdiction. And then this person said, uh, so what the way forward would be upgrading existing taxis so that they could be called like Uber and then uh, have the drivers and passengers rate each other. Mm -hmm. And this actually gets support again across the board from, from Uber drivers even. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we, we then use this as regulations which we passed last week. Uh, so this is my main point. Okay. Yeah. Right, so, what are you up to today? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, how much do you know about blockchain things so far? So, uh, I have a Bitcoin account, a okay. wallet. Uh, I charge uh, one Bitcoin per hour uh, for my consulting work. Uh, and then, um, but the major organizations, Apple, Oxford University, and so on, who I deal with, uh, all say that they have no accounting system capable of handling Bitcoin. Right. Um, so they just take whatever, um, like Bitcoin to pounds or Bitcoin to US dollars, at the time of, of the signature uh, of, of my consulting contract and then pay that to me. So, so far, no major organizations has paid me, paid me any Bitcoin, which makes me very, very disappointed. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> bad. <laughs> No, I, I'm aware of the, the DAO, I'm aware of the fork. I, I, I view the code, that, uh, I read the code that, that led to the fork. I understood the, the, the stack overflow thing um, oh, cool. that it does. Uh, I saw a lot of smart contract uh, thing going on uh, in the Reddit um, yeah. forums. Um, uh, frankly speaking, I think a lot of it are, are distorting the English language. Uh, in the sense that they, they use the same words but refer to very different things. Yes. Uh, okay. So, so like you actually regret calling them smart contracts now. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, so the very word I feel uncomfortable saying that. Mm -hmm. um, and then other than that, not, nothing much because um, I, I don't have an Ethereum account and uh, while I understand the purpose, I would really like to learn instead of the governance model that, that makes it... Because for, for things like this, this, this used to be a proprietary software. Right. And then we, we had to convince the makers to make it open source mm -hmm. and make it hostable by, by the government to, right. to feel comfortable yeah. with it. And, and, and of course, because this is public policy we're talking about, people would demand a, a open data at every yeah. step so they can run their own regression and cluster right. analysis. Yeah. But this naturally leads to forks. Mm -hmm. And, and this, this creates a tension between the government system, say, if the uh, because one of the designers uh, choices in designing this system is that no matter how small a cluster is, as long as there is a small cluster, you will see a small cluster here that says four, mm -hmm. and then instead of five hundred and six hundred. Mm -hmm. So if you run with a strictly uh, like um, proportional uh, graph, then this will be like less than a pixel, and then mm -hmm. you wouldn't see it. But because uh, the designer is a believer in Aristotelian community building, uh, or, or Habermas, or whatever, uh, he thinks that the minority should should be given a chance to grow. Right. Right? But some, some of the cities who adopt this may not want that, so they will change the, the visualization model, and, and even the machine learning model, to, to basically be proportional. Mm -hmm. And then that will lead to a very different path of policy right. making. And, yeah. and, and then it will make governance between all those folks very different. Yeah. Very different. No, I mean, that's... Blockchains are kind of in, a, in an interesting place because it, forking them is not quite the same thing as forking free software projects. Exactly. It's, yes. Look on the free software side, like some people can use a LibreOffice and some people can use or, the traditional open office at the same time, and it's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, if a blockchain splits in half, like that's uh, obviously quite a different thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's more like a secession. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, so like, yeah, it's, it's, it sounds like you. If you've read enough Ethereum code to have uh, read about how the DAO hack works, you probably know a lot of the basics. Um, yeah, so like I, yeah, I first came up with the idea for Ethereum back about three years ago because at the time people were interested in blockchain applications and using it for stuff other than just like Bitcoin payments. But uh, 
with the existing blockchains at the time, they're basically saying either one blockchain per feature or what I call Swiss Army Knife protocols, where you say, here's like 15 things you can do, let's just make a blockchain for them. 15 colors, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> So I joined one of these projects and I got yeah, within three weeks I invented three new colors and so uh, I, they had to make a new version of the protocol but then I realized that's not really sustainable and fortunately we have a more abstract way of doing it called programming languages mm -hmm. and that's where Ethereum kind of came from. So um, I mean it's starting to the um, you know, network is starting, well, it, it is growing, starting to be used for lots of things. Um, on the governance side, it still feel like it's fairly, yeah, in general, governance of crypto is this very interesting and very young sort of field, especially if you look at like, both things on the Ethereum side and also Bitcoin's issues around block sizes. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, like the challenge is that I feel like it's not quite like open source software and it's not quite like a country, it's almost somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have these different kinds of actors, like you have users, you have traders on a market, you have uh, miners, you have exchanges, mm -hmm. and all of them are um, like stakeholders and, they're, and even like participants in governance to some extent. Like they're not just people who benefit from the system, they're people who have actions that they can take, like which software they run, what they what, what, what do they buy ETH, do they sell ETC the other way around, mm -hmm. um, do, what, what, what do they mine, like if, if they mine, like what flags do they set, mm -hmm. and the, like it's, it, it definitely is interesting in terms of how it's, uh, the, the specific ways in which it, it, in which it empowers people, mm -hmm. and how it's, uh, I would, even, like, I would, I also say it's halfway in between voting in a market to some extent. Um, but uh, I mean, obviously, if these uh, if these systems are to mature, like the model has to sort of move to like it needs to stabilize to the point where people understand how it works, understand sort of, um, like what what it would take to to cause it to change in a certain way for pe for people to be to be assured that the system will keep operating in ways that they're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, so, like one. Like in general, one property that be the, uh, one of the main reasons why people are interested in these systems is that uh, what based, once, once a contract's in there, it, it's in there. And uh, it, unless uh, the contract has rules to change itself, it's mm -hmm. not going to change. Mm -hmm. And if the, like the rules of the protocol change in, in, in random ways that makes the code start to mean different things, then that, like, it, it realistically does reduce the value proposition. So that's... Uh, but at the same time, like you have this challenge that it's a fairly young system, and like sometimes uh, tweaks are necessary for it to like, either be more, to because like things come up that you didn't even realize two years ago. Sure. Yeah. So, like after the DAO fork, the the uh, the recent set of issues that we've been having that are pretty interesting is so we've had a set of uh, denial of service attacks where basically attackers sent like a bunch of transactions where. <clears throat> the uh, transactions were count work crafted in such a way that the ratio between the uh, amount of time that it takes to process and the amount of gas that it consumes, uh -huh. where gas was uh, like, intended to be uh, almost a measure of time, but like, they managed to sort of manipulate the ratio up as much as possible, and then they made transactions that are really slow to process. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, that forced us to optimize all the clients a bunch, but it also did uh, lead to like a, a a couple of protocol changes that happened to be made. Mm -hmm. um, so, look, that was um, look, look, that wasn't really uh, controversial, but it was still something that did have like it did have to happen quickly. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Another interesting difference between um, between Ethereum and Bitcoin is that in our case, we actually have like well seven implementations, three actively used implementations of the same protocol, mm -hmm. and. So that basically means that like, there isn't one development team that can uh, kind of force things in its own direction. And uh, we do have to, like, if we want to make a protocol change, like, no matter what, we basically have to negotiate between Go developers, developers of Perry, and developers of Java. Mm -hmm. And that does make, it, it does make things slower, it does make things contentious sometimes, but it does, like, it is, I guess, uh, 
kind of multi-stakeholder and democratic in certain ways, and the results of your good things. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see what else can I say? Um, I mean, I guess in terms of uh, what the uh, Look, the other thing is the, the sort of happier thing that's happening is that people are finally starting to use Ethereum for like, various interesting things. Mm -hmm. um, like, about uh, up until before, maybe for the first half year, it was basically like uh, games, uh, people moving Ether around, just like very simple experiments. And now, like, I was actually at a conference in Las Vegas and I met someone, and there was some identity verification like application that's being used by a couple thousand people in Africa. Mm -hmm. And I like, just found out about this. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, fairly, it's fairly interesting and it, and it shows that people are uh, uh, starting to like actually look actually look at look at it and take it and uh, take it seriously. And particularly bridge the gap between the blockchain world and the real world. Because like one of the things is that with blockchains, like obviously if you have an application that's uh, just purely cryptographic and like purely exists that's already on the chain. Then, on the one hand, like that's something that's completely trust free because like everything runs in code mm -hmm. and the co uh, like as so uh, as long as the code is correct and uh, as long as the network works, it's guaranteed to work exactly as it's supposed to work. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the number of things that you can do in like that kind of fully closed environment is very small. Mm -hmm. Like you can, you can you can do math. But you have no, like blockchains have no idea if the temperature in Taipei is twenty five degrees or forty thousand degrees, mm -hmm. and the, the, so if you wants to go into mainstream finance or even identity verification or like but like most things that are like actually really interesting, mm -hmm. that you have to kind of bridge that in some way, and uh, the other challenge is I guess bridging that without introducing levels of centralization that are like so uh, th that are so high that there's basically no point in using a blockchain anymore. So there's uh, interesting balances there. Uh, so um, have you, uh, yeah, has Alex uh, told you about the things that he's doing in Taiwan no, yet? No, no. I mean, before that, maybe we can talk a bit about the general developer community here, because that's mm -hmm. something that uh, Vitalik is keenly interested in that, whether it's in universities or in industry or just on the weekends, folks getting together I and mean, we have a meetup on Sunday that uh, Vitalik will be presenting his developer presentation. Um, you know, uh, Vitalik 